there you go, I lost again. <laughs> That's the gambler's refrain. I'm going to talk about gambling. Uh, you'll uh, not find a scripture that says, do not gamble. I wish we had a scripture that says, do not gamble. It would make it so much easier for me. Uh, but some interpret this silence as a license, thinking if the Bible does not forbid gambling, then gambling is permitted. Is this right? That's the question. My answer is no. You might ask why? Well, because the Bible forbids gambling in principle and through precedent, as I will show in this lesson. The first uh, principle is by their fruits. By their fruits you shall know them, Jesus told his disciples. Uh, it's a God-given litmus test to protect us against false teachers. By their fruits you shall know them. But it's also a reliable test when judging gamblers. What are the char characteristic fruits of a compulsive gambler? Well, a short list is loving money, owing money, borrowing money and not paying back, lying, cheating, unreliability, selfishness, covetousness, greed, pride, obsession and godlessness. Are these good fruits or bad fruits? Anyone who has lived with a compulsive gambler will know they are bad fruits. The poor wife who has to deal with the loss of a month's salary squandered by her husband on horses or the dogs, she knows. Employers who have had their profits embezzled by an accountant who was a secret gamble or gambler. They know. <laughs> Children who have had their piggy bank savings raided by a father desperate for gambling money. They know. <clears throat> by the precedent, you shall know them by their fruits. The gambler is... A guilty man. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5. Here's how the Holy Spirit defines the times that we live in. But realize this, he says, that in the last days difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of God, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, <coughs> avoid such men as these, he tells us. He's mentioned here love of self and then immediately after love of money. The naive saying money makes the world go round, the world go round, the world go round. Happy-go-lucky money is the answer to all things or everything, as the fool says in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 19. Money isn't the answer to everything. The rich farmer, you remember that story in Luke chapter 12? He thought, listen, I need to build the bigger barns. The crops are so good. I'll bring all these crops in. And when he got them in, he, he said, well, now uh, I've got many things laid up for um, the rest of my life, for all the days to come. Um, let my soul eat, drink, and be merry. And the Lord said, you fool, tonight, tonight, without a, an opportunity to enjoy any of it, his soul was required of him. Could he buy off his own death? No way. 
Money doesn't matter when it comes to death. And money won't matter when it comes to the judgment either. God can't be bought <laughs> off. We need to listen to that. Every man has his price, at least so I'm told. And maybe they're right. But God cannot be bought off. The naive gambler loves money and foolishly relishes both these lies, that money makes the world go round and that money is the answer to everything. The stuff of the gambler's dream is winning the jackpot. What would be the point of gambling, at least for him, if there is no jackpot? It is the prospect of hearing the clink, clink, clink of coins pouring into the tray of a one-armed bandit that keeps the gambler going. You know, he could stand there all night, but what he wants to hear is that, that flood of money pouring down into that metal box, which means he's hit the jackpot. And if he gets a few pennies or a few uh, coins, that just gives him the motive to go on and on. He's looking for something bigger than he's got. And he keeps at it, maybe even all night. There are people so addicted to those things that they will stay in those gambling casinos all night pulling the arm of the one-armed bandit. How about the excitement of winning the lotto? There's lots of people in Ireland who have imagined themselves winning the lotto. And every week, religiously, they go out and buy the ticket and keep it safe, hoping that their numbers will come up. And the idea that if I win six million, my life will just be so beautiful. Everything will be right for me. Everybody will be happy, and, and particularly me. So winning the, the lotto or the Grand National, or better still, breaking the bank at Monte Carlo, surely presents the dream in all its fullness for the gambler. Money is the gambler's god. It's not just a small matter. It's not even a matter of making a few uh, euros. It's, it's becomes a god to him. His whole life centers around gambling. But the Bible teaches the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Let's look at 1 Timothy. You're there in 2 Timothy if you haven't closed your Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and in verse 12. Or verse 10, I should say. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to read from verse 9. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. There are people who call themselves Christians and their only aim in life is to become rich or famous or maybe rich and famous. But that's what they're living for. That's what they're looking for. Uh, looking for. They're not looking to please God. They're not even thinking about heaven. They're just looking for what they can get out of this life and they're hoping to become rich and famous. Um, most gamblers have not considered their future. Nor have they considered the fact that wealth actually makes itself wings like the eagle that flies towards the heavens. Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Now, the, the idea it seems to be presented is that it makes for itself wings. Here's the money becoming like, like an eagle. It flies away from you. It flies up into the sky. So far up into the sky, it's out of sight. It's gone, so far as you're concerned. That's how quickly we can lose money. And that's why it is a very um, foolish thing to make it the foundation of our lives. 
I'm not disputing the fact that we need money to live. I'm not disputing the fact that it's good to have enough to be able to pay your bills and to put food on the table. Maybe to have a holiday or whatever else. I'm not disputing any of that. I'm talking about this obsession with money where I can think of nothing else, where it's the only thing that matters in my life. And there are millions of people who are consumed with those thoughts and live in that way. I doubt if the gambler ever gives any consideration to the future or ever gives any deep thought to what might happen even if he, even if he hit the jackpot. How his life would change and how it would change, not necessarily for the better, but for the worse. The gambler gambles to live and lives to gamble. So it's a vicious cycle. He gambles to live and lives to gamble. Nothing else matters for the gambler. So will we say the gambler loves money? Yes, he does. Does the Bible tell us that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil? Yes, it does. Do you believe the Bible? If you do, you've got to reconsider your love for money and your attraction towards money. We move on now to being mastered by gambling. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, and let's have a look there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. He sets down the principle. He says, all things are lawful for me. That is, as a Christian, I'm not bound by the law uh, of Moses. All things are lawful for me. All I'm bound by is by the law of law. But not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Controlled, mastered. Something becomes your master, it's dictating to you, it's telling you what you should do, where you, where you should go, uh, what you should wear, all, all your whole life. If you understood what living under a master as a slave was like, you would understand what he's trying to get across here. Things can master us. Money can master us. Gambling can master us. Alcohol can master us. Drugs can master us. We're no longer in control of our lives. The thing we've given ourselves to becomes our master. The ritual of gambling is obsessive. And the addicted gambler is mastered because his mind and his will are taken over by gambling. And that's bad enough. What I need to warn everybody about is that the unsuspecting are lured into gambling by disarming remarks from other gamblers, such as, it won't do you any harm, it's just a bit of fun. Or, think of the good causes you're helping by buying this ticket or making a donation to this cause. But the Gamblers Anonymous tells a darker, more sinister story because it tells of broken promises, broken marriages, broken lives, depression, and suicide. We don't like to hear these things. The image, the dream, is so different to the reality. But we're not to be dreamers. We're, as Christians, to face the realities in life, to cope with the realities in life, with God's help, of course. We're to be sober-minded in every way. Like all sin, the gambling obsession controls and ultimately destroys the gambler. This contradicts the biblical principle, I will not be mastered by anything. 
These people are mastered. The spirit of obsession and gambling masters their every, uh, their every move in life. So my advice for anybody who wants to play around with gambling, and this is based on what I know from scripture, is to stay away from all forms of it. That way, you can never become addicted. Just stay away from it altogether. Don't start asking yourselves, oh, well, it is a good cause, and, and uh, you know, and, and the prize money is good, but uh, should I or shouldn't I? Is it or isn't? Just stay away from it. If, uh, if you heard the swine flu outbreak had, uh, had uh, started again, would you deliberately go into a home where the swine flu had hit every member of the family? Would you play around with or in the company of people who had swine flu? No, you'd, you'd be sensible. You'd be stupid to do it. You'd say, no, look, I've, I'm not trying to hurt the people, but it's ridiculous for me to, uh, to put myself in the way of contagion and to get the swine flu and to be as sick as these people are. Now, we can see it in, in that instance. Why can't we see it when it comes to gambling? God has laid it down. You cannot serve God and riches. You can't be split in your mind, on the one hand, pretending you're serving God, on the other hand, giving all your attention to, to riches. Now, this, this, all this is very subtle because um, e even people who are not gamblers can be uh, giving their lives over to earning money, which is legitimate. But it's not legitimate to earn money and to forsake the Lord, to be earning money and not coming to worship, to be earning money but have no time to encourage or build up your fellow Christians, to be earning money and neglecting your family, your wife and your children. There's lots of people who are very respectable in our society who are doing all these things and are cloaking it with, this is a hard working man and he provides well for his family. He provides money for his family. He's now pro uh, providing uh, um, emotional support. He's not there in the flesh to help out with all of the difficulties of the home and the discipline of the children. It just works. You shall not covet is the tenth commandment your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's goods, your neighbor's donkey, whatever he has. You are not to follow the whole ethos of this generation in this time, and that is keep up with the Joneses. If your next door neighbor gets a car, a new car, you've got to get a new car. If the woman across the road puts up new curtains, you've got to get new curtains. If friends of yours are going on holidays, you're breaking your neck to go on holidays. They can't do anything or have anything, but you want to have it yourself. Now, you can be of the type that says, okay, I want it and I'll, I'll pay for it. Or you can be like the robber and say, they have it, I'm going to rob it so I can have it. Or you can be like the gambler and say, I'll get it all as soon as I win the jackpot.
Jesus says in another place, you cannot serve God and wealth or riches. Matthew chapter 6, 24. You know, the Bible authorizes three legitimate ways of getting money. One, by good old-fashioned work. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 11 and 12, he says to the Thessalonian brethren, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need, he says. So God wants us to work. That's the way God expects us to earn our living and provide for our family and help the needy. There's another way by the exchange of goods and services. Deuteronomy chapter 25, 13 to 16. Deuteronomy 25. You shall not have in your bag differing weights, a large and a small. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall have a full and just weight. You shall have a full and just measure that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. For everyone who does these things, everyone who acts unjustly is an abomination to the Lord your God. So, you sell your goods, the person who's buying them has to give you a proper price for the goods that you're selling. You have to uh, put a proper price on what you're selling uh, and uh, everybody is to be upright and honest with each other in this transaction and God is taking account of whether we are robbing each other or cheating each other or whatever is going on that we're doing wrong. And he says, the, the, the normal transactions of either giving something for something or buying something from someone are the ways of making money or um, becoming rich. Um, the, the last way that you can get money legitimately is true benevolence. Uh, we know benevolence was, um, an emergency thing for the church uh, in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. Um, those who had stayed behind in Jerusalem because they were converted and uh, didn't go back to their home countries meant that there was a lot of people who were in trouble financially and who needed help uh, in the Jerusalem congregation. Acts chapter 2 verse 44 says, And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. So here was, here was uh, a legitimate way of receiving money if you received money through benevolence. That, that being, of course, that you needed the benevolence and it was given to you. Now gambling is an attempt to beat the, um, or to beat every legitimate way of getting money. Gambling allows the gambler to get other people's money without working for it or giving anything in exchange for it. This is an important point here. The gambler is taking other people's money Actually, the whole thing of gambling, the whole setup is, is ridiculous. If somebody decides that uh, they'll provide a jackpot, uh, and uh, they, they say to, they put it out into the community that uh, if you buy a ticket, um, you will get uh, X amount of money uh, if your ticket comes up in the draw. Now, uh, you could start this off without having a penny. 
You can just make the promise because all the money that will flood in will be divided up and given as prize money. So whose money is being given as the prize money? Your money. Everybody who's contributed, it's just your money that's been given out as prize money. So the person who wins is taking everybody else's money. Now the person who set this thing up in the first place, it's funny isn't it? Do you see these programs on the lotto wins and they uh, come up and uh, they, they, they can play games to get X amount of money out of the games and, and, uh, and a lot of people talk about we're giving you this and we're giving you that. You are, are you? Who gave you the money in the first place? Whose money is it? It's all so, such foolishness. But the actual, the actual principle here is that you, they're making it possible for, for people to circumvent honest ways of earning money and taking money from other people without giving anything back or without giving any service for that money. A, a good person should not take advantage of the disadvantaged by gambling. It's morally wrong. And this is especially so when you know that most people who gamble are the poor and vulnerable in our society and they can ill afford to throw away their money on gambling. If you love others, you will do them no wrong. That's why love is the fulfillment of the law. By gambling, you're doing wrong to other people. Or you're intending to do wrong by other people if you win uh, what has been offered. The Christian must forever get it out of their head that money is the answer to life. God is the answer to life. God is the one who provides. God is the one we must trust. By praying for his daily bread, a genuine Christian acknowledges his dependence on God. Matthew 6, verse 24. Give us this day our daily bread. We're not praying that prayer to the boss of your, of your job. We're praying that prayer to God, who is the supervisor of your boss. At the end of the day, it's God who empowers us to earn money. We know that from Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. And the Christian certainly does not rail against God because he has ordained, by the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Genesis 3, 19. This, this is the hidden factor and the, uh, which is very rarely brought out. God had ordained as a curse for the man because of his disobedience. By the sweat of your brow, you will earn your bread until you return to the dust. By the sweat of your brow. It'd be like uh, trying to overcome the pain in childbirth. Now there is ways and means of reducing it and make, making it tolerable but there's an association between pain and childbirth, and there's an association between toil and earning and providing for your family. And God has made that association. We must work, and we must work in honorable occupations to be pleasing to God and to show our dependence on God. That's what we're doing. We're showing our dependence on God. Now, years ago, there was a terrible attitude in our society. People didn't want to work. And they wanted to get paid for not working. And I'm sure there are still many of those people around, even in the present day. They're using the social welfare, for their own convenience and to live an indolent life. 
for the Christian, the social welfare may be an emergency stopgap until you get a job again. But it's not to become the be-all and end-all in our thinking. The Christian must be ingrained with the idea that we will work until we return to the dust. And that we mustn't seek any other ways of providing for ourselves or making ourselves rich. Moving on, laziness is forbidden. The gambler, however, or the gambler's desire, however, is to live like the idle rich. If I win the lotto, I will never work again. That is a sentiment expressed time and again by those who like, to, uh, who like a so-called flutter. Shangri-La for such a person is being rich enough to walk away from the drudgery of the eight-hour day. He craves the indolent life where he can lie in bed all day if he so pleases. Like a teenager on Saturday morning. <laughs> in bed all day. Can't get them out of it. Not with a crowbar, you couldn't get them out of it. But that's, that's what the gambler wants for himself. He, he, that's, he thinks that is the ultimate in living. How foolish is that? The Bible says, and let's look at it, Proverbs chapter 6, 10 through 11. He says there, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. Laziness is not something that should be a description of our lives or the way we behave. We should be diligent people, diligent about our work, diligent about our service to God, diligent about our, our morals, diligent about the way we treat other people. We should be diligent about all of these things. We shouldn't be slothful at all. The work ethic is firmly entrenched in scripture. If a man does not work, neither let him eat. We're told in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 6 through 10. And I, I really do want us to read this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 6 through 10. Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to anyone of you. Not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this in order. In, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons are commanded, or uh, such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus to work in a quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Now that's very straightforward and very clear. You are not to impose on other people for your food. You are to provide it for yourself. You are not to live an undisciplined, lazy, indolent life. You are to be disciplined and you are to work for what you need, to provide what you need, 
and you are to make that effort in the face of all sorts of difficulties. Gambling, brethren, fosters laziness and indolence. On all these counts, it is an enemy of eating your bread by the sweat of your brow and of the Bible work ethic. Nevertheless, the gambler wants to live in a way that violates all of these principles and he cares less. He cares less. God appeals to people about coming out from their midst. It's hard to believe when looking at Royal Ascot on television that it is anything less than a grand occasion. How beguiling are the men in their top hats and tails and the women in the pretty dresses and bonnets. The pageantry of colourful riders and thoroughbred horses straining every muscle, vying with each other to be first past the post, makes the excitement palpable. It's hard to associate any sort of shady cockfighting or backstreet gambling or criminality with such grandeur. But in truth, the only difference between them is that one is formal and the other casual. One wears a top hat and gloves, the other smelly sneakers and jeans. Both are gamblers. Doesn't matter how you dress it up, they're gamblers. They love money. They care less about God. They want the lifestyle, the lazy lifestyle, that winnings will bring them. <coughs> Don't be fooled. To hang around with the get-rich-quick merchants and other shady characters, whether you're in Las Vegas or the local betting shops, in the gaming arcades or at the Greyhound and horse racing tracks, is to be influenced by these people. The Bible says if you associate with an angry man, you will learn his ways, Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. By the same deduction, if you hang around with gamblers, you will learn their ways also, because bad company corrupts good morals, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Jesus says, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters, Matthew chapter 12, 30. Very serious. When Peter mingled with the ungodly at Jesus' trial, he ended up cursing and swearing and denying the Lord. Do you think you're stronger than Peter? We're being called by God, come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. God's not saying, stay with them, enjoy their company, associate as much as you like with them. He's saying, come out. A respectful, a respectful coming out. We have to distance ourselves. We have to be afraid of the contamination. We have to show that we're different. The ultimate gamble is what I want to finish up with. We, we heard this story. Uh, last week, a man called Achan took a chance that God would not punish him for doing what God told him not to do. But Achan's gamble did not pay off. He was found out. And after he was found out, he was called to account and condemned by God. Achan lost everything. And this is the whole point about gambling. You're putting on line your whole life, everything you possess. Achan lost everything, his family, his possessions, and his life. You read it in jo Joshua chapter 7. If you choose to gamble, you also are taking a risk. You take the chance that God will overlook what he, in principle and through precedent, has condemned in the Bible. I ask you, is it wise to gamble with your eternal salvation by being disobedient to God? 
now that you know about gambling, or now that you know better about gambling, you ought to make the right choice between God and money. I'll leave it with you to think about.